There's something I find very appealing about chess, beyond just being a fun game to play. Like the fact that it's interesting is itself interesting. It's a small board with simple rules and no hidden information, and yet countless people throughout history have devoted their lives to it. The skill expression is practically limitless. Someone who's never played before would have no chance against someone who's played a little bit and knows some basic guidelines. And I've wasted enough time on this game that that person would hopefully have no chance against me. But then I would almost certainly lose to anyone rated 1800 FIDE, who would almost certainly lose to anyone rated 2200 FIDE, who would almost certainly lose to any of the top players, and even these top players are equally helpless against modern chess engines. For most human purposes, these engines might as well be perfect, but they're not really. They're being improved all the time, and they have a wide range of results when they play against each other. Chess is not fundamentally a game of outsmarting the other player, it is simply a game of finding the correct move in a given position. And yet, despite centuries of chess theory and decades of engine development, those theoretically correct moves remain unknown in all but the most specific scenarios. For more complex games, it's not at all surprising that we don't know the exact correct move in any situation. The number of game states is practically infinite, the set of possible moves is very, very large, and a human wouldn't be able to execute anything perfectly anyway. But chess just feels so simple. Why can't we make a table of every position and its best move and solve chess forever? Maybe not now, but in the future when computers are a bit faster. How much work would that be? How many positions are there that can be reached from the starting position via a sequence of legal moves? This is a question I've always wondered about ever since I was a kid, long before I had any idea how to go about solving it. We'll soon see that it's beyond the scope of this video, and indeed beyond the scope of our current knowledge, to calculate this number exactly. But we can start out with a simple upper bound, and gradually get more complex, tighter bounds as we go. I think it's a really cool example of how, even though we can never fully understand everything, we can use math to incrementally get closer to the truth. The first step is to define what we mean by position. Conceptually, I'm thinking of it in terms of this hypothetical table. If I want to use the table to find the best move in a given position, what information do I have to specify to make sure it knows what I'm talking about? Different arrangements of pieces on the board are clearly different positions, but it's not quite that simple. For example, this arrangement with white to move needs to be considered separately from the same arrangement with black to move. For this board, which of the four castling moves are possible is determined by what happened earlier in the game, so since we're only looking at a snapshot of the game, we need to include that information as well. Similarly, here, which if any on passant capture is possible is determined by which if any of the pawns moved two squares last turn. Since we don't know what happened last turn, we need to include this information as well. And finally, due to the 50 move rule, we need to know how many half moves it's been since the last capture or pawn move. This is exactly what FEN describes, if you ignore the full move number, which has no effect on the outcome. But what about threefold repetition, I hear you say? The repeated positions don't have to be consecutive, so that depends on the entire sequence of moves. Shit, alright, forget what I said earlier. We're not talking about chess, we're talking about a different game. Chess, which has the same rules as chess, except threefold repetition is not a draw. Hear me out. If the same position occurs again, that means there have been no captures or pawn moves since then. With two perfect players, if one has a way to win, they would not allow any repetition, and if they repeat at all, they would continue repeating until the 50 move rule is reached. Draws by threefold repetition are nice in that humans have better things to do than move the same pieces back and forth 25 times, but they're not necessary for the theoretical game. To avoid ambiguity, I'll call an arrangement of pieces on the 64 squares a board state, and an entire position that includes information about turn, on passant rights, castling rights, and half move number, a game state. The number of game states for a particular board state will be referred to as that board state's multiplicity. Here are some equivalent mathematical definitions. With that, we're ready to begin. First of all, there are 64 squares on the board, and each square has 13 possible states, 6 white, 6 black, and 1 empty. Therefore, the number of possible board states is at most 13 to the 64th power. Next, the multiplicity for any board state is at most 2 for whose turn it is, times 101 for the half move number, times 16 for the four binary castling rights, times 6 for en passant rights, equals 19,392. So we get an upper bound of 19,392 times 13 to the 64th game states, which is approximately 3.802 times 10 to the 75th, or 3.802 quatuor vigintillion. It's common knowledge that the number of possible chess games is larger than the number of atoms in the observable universe, but 
In my opinion, this quantity is much more representative of the complexity of chess. And even this naive calculation has gotten us below that number, which is pretty cool. We're now at mere intergalactic levels of complexity. A useful idea to consider when moving from one estimate to the next is, what are the most obviously impossible game states that we're currently including? If I show you this position, there are all sorts of issues you could raise, but your first thought probably isn't, why are both kings in check? Or, how does black have a pawn on the first rank? It's probably, why the hell are there so many pieces? White and black each start the game with 16 pieces on the board. These pieces can be removed through captures and transformed through pawn promotion, but two simple facts remain. Each side always has exactly one king, and each side always has at most 16 total pieces. So instead of thinking in terms of which type of piece happens to be on each square, it might be more useful to think in terms of which square each piece happens to be on, given a certain number of pieces. Here's what I mean. Say white has 9 pieces remaining and black has 12 pieces remaining. Then, to calculate the total number of board states for those particular values, we find the number of ways we can place one white king square, one black king square, 8 white non-king squares, and 11 black non-king squares, and then multiply it by the number of ways we can assign different pieces to those non-king squares. The latter is simply equal to 5 to the power of the number of non-king squares, since each non-king square can be occupied by either a pawn, a knight, a bishop, a rook, or a queen. The former isn't too complicated either. We're dividing up 64 objects into sets of size 1, 1, 8, 11, and 43. There are 64 factorial ways to order 64 objects, and since we don't care about the order of objects within sets, we divide by the product of the factorials of each size. We can generalize this to any number of black and white pieces. Let w be the total number of white pieces, and let b be the total number of black pieces. Then to get the total number of board states, we sum over the number of board states for each possible combination of w and b. And when I plug that into Wolfram Alpha, I get this. Multiply by the maximum multiplicity of 19,392 again to get an upper bound of about 6.150 times 10 to the 54th, or 6.15 septen decillion game states. This is already a lot better. This is less than the number of atoms in the sun. Nice. Again, we're still counting some nonsensical game states here. Take this for example. White has only 16 pieces, but 15 of them are pawns, which is completely impossible. There's no way to turn other pieces into pawns. Black set of pieces is also impossible. Each queen passed the first one, each rook passed the second one, each bishop passed the second one, and each knight passed the second one, are all extra pieces that could have only come from pawn promotion. Black has six of these extra pieces, plus four pawns remaining, so they would have needed ten pawns, which of course they never had. In order to handle cases like this, we'll need to consider every type of piece separately, since for example four rooks requires more promotions than two rooks and two knights. This makes things complicated enough that I'm going to abandon Wolfram Alpha and bring out the code, but I'll also explain what I'm doing in math terms. First, we construct a list of all possible tuples of piece numbers that meet our criteria. Then for each possible white tuple, and each possible black tuple, we compute the number of board states for those particular values, and the total number of board states is again just the sum over all possible values. Before writing this, I want to do a quick test. If I switch the condition back to a simple p plus n plus b plus r plus q less than or equal to 15, this should give the exact same result as the previous level. We're computing it in a more complicated way, but the conditions on allowed board states are exactly the same. Okay, that checks out. Just one more thing. Pawns cannot be on the first or eighth ranks, so we'll change the formula to reflect that. This is basically just choosing where the pawns go first, and then choosing where everything else goes among the remaining squares. Alright, there's the number of board states. Multiply by the maximum multiplicity again, and we get... 4.642 times 10 to the 53. Less than Jupiter now. It feels like we've got a pretty decent handle on the board states now. We're still including plenty of impossible ones, but they're getting harder to include in the calculation. At this point, I think the lowest hanging fruit is not the board states, but the multiplicity. Up until now, we've been multiplying every board state by 16 to account for the different possible castling rights. But there are only 16 possible castling rights if there are kings and rooks in all their starting positions, which is not likely to be the case. The nice thing about possible castling rights is they depend only on these six squares. There are between 1 and 16 of them, depending on which subset of these squares contain the pieces that start on them. 
That's potentially 64 different cases to cover, but we can do better than that. It's pretty annoying to calculate the number of board states that don't have, say, a rook in the top right anyway. So what if, instead of looking at how many board states have some particular starting pieces and not others, we only consider how many board states have at least some particular starting pieces, and possibly others. Here's what I mean. We start by taking the number of board states that have at least none of these starting pieces. In other words, all board states. The ones that don't have any starting pieces should end up with a castling multiplicity of 1, so those are done. But for the ones that do have starting pieces, we still need to add more copies of them to reach our desired multiplicity. Next we try to fix the board states with castling multiplicity 2, i.e. the board states with exactly one king-rook pair in their starting positions. By definition, the board states with a castling multiplicity of 4 are those that meet exactly two of these new criteria. The ones with 8 meet 3, and the ones with 16 meet all 4. So after this step, this is how many times they are currently being counted. Next we have to add one copy of every board state with castling multiplicity 4, i.e. every board state with two king-rook pairs. Here's what that looks like. Every board state with castling multiplicity 8 meets exactly three of these conditions, and every board state with castling multiplicity 16 meets all six, so here's where we're at with the counting. Next we add one copy for every board state with castling multiplicity 8, which also adds four copies of every board state with castling multiplicity 16, so we're almost done, we just need to add one final copy of every board state with castling multiplicity 16. Finally, we substitute in our expressions for number of board states in terms of the number of pieces of each type, combine like terms, and we end up with only nine terms to calculate. Adding this into the program, we get this. Remember that this already includes all castling multiplicity, so we only multiply by 2 times 6 times 101 to get the game state bound. 2.913 times 10 to the 52. Less than the number of atoms in Uranus. Another way we could bring down the multiplicity is to be more accurate about the number of possible en passant rights. But en passant depends on very specific positional information about both black and white pawns, so before doing that, it'll be helpful to get a more detailed understanding of pawn structure. We're already calculating the number of pawn structures separately, since pawns can't be on the first or eighth rank, so they don't interfere with the castling multiplicity at all. All we want to do is get a more accurate bound than this. See, this assumes that black and white pawns can be anywhere along the second to seventh ranks, but they're actually very limited in their movement. Each movement between files necessarily consumes an opponent piece. So for example, if all of black's pieces are still on the board, white cannot have any two pawns on the same file. If we consider every column of pawns separately, we should be able to get a tighter bound at the cost of a slower computation. However, if we just expand the tuple in this way, we'll end up with way too many terms in the sum. We have to avoid unnecessarily repeating work. The number of possible pawn structures doesn't depend on every single value in this tuple anyway. It only depends on the number of pawns each player has, and the number of captures each player has made. So we can pre-compute the number of pawn structures for each combination of pawns and captures, and then just look it up in a table. Here's the plan. For every pawn column tuple, we compute the number of pawn structures for it, the total number of white and black pawns, and the minimum numbers of white captures and black captures needed to reach that structure. Then we add the number of pawn structures to the entry for those numbers of pawns and captures in a table we're building up. And then we transform this table so that, given a certain number of captures made, we get the number of structures that need that many captures or less. Two questions. One, is this computationally realistic? How many pawn column tuples are there? Stars and Bars tells us that there's 12,870 ways to pick the white values, so we square that to get about 166 million total. It might take a while, but it's doable. Two, how do we calculate the minimum number of captures needed? Well, it's the minimum number of times we have to move a pawn to an adjacent column in order to undouble every pawn of that color. We're only considering one color here, so we can also pre-compute these values and look them up for both colors. To do this, we get the column indices of the empty columns and the column indices of the extra pawns, with duplicates if there are more than two pawns in a column, and then pair them up in a way that minimizes the sum of differences. If the number of extra pawns is the same as the number of empty columns, we just put the leftmost one in the leftmost empty column, etc., since two pawns crossing paths would be inefficient. If there are more empty columns than extra pawns, we have to try each combination of the appropriate number of empty columns, and then do the same thing. Note that it's impossible for there to be more extra pawns than empty columns, since that would imply more than 8 pawns total. 
We're almost ready, but while we're on the topic of pawn movement, note that pawn promotions require pawns to capture or be captured. For example, in order for white's e-pawn to get past black's e-pawn and promote, at least one of the following things must happen. White's e-pawn captures a black piece, black's e-pawn captures a white piece, or a white piece captures black's e-pawn. It's the same story for any other pawn. Each capture has the potential to allow for one promotion per player, and each capture of a pawn has the potential to allow for an additional promotion for the capturing player, but no more. So let's make sure to short circuit if there are too many promotions. Also, at this point, the code is getting to be a bit of a mysterious black box that outputs a single number. I'm going to keep track of how many board states are associated with each of these combinations of pawns and captures, so that we can look it over and have a little more confidence that everything is working correctly. There we go. Again, we multiply by 2 times 6 times 101 to get a game state bound of 2.528 times 10 to the 49th. The longer runtime was definitely worth it. We've gone down by a factor of a thousand, and are now less than the number of atoms in the moon. Here are the numbers of pawns and captures with the most associated board states, including Castle Multiplicity, and here are the ones with the least non-zero associated board states. It's hard to say exactly what this means, but it passes the eye test to me. At the lower end, we can easily calculate those values explicitly and see that they match up. For example, 0 pawns and 15 captures for both players means just two kings on the board, which is indeed 4,032 possibilities if you forget about check. At the upper end, we can see that the most productive tuples are those with a few pawns and a few captures. Having a few pawns makes sense, since having a variety of all pieces, including pawns, means more distinct ways to arrange them. And it may seem like having no captures would give more board states than a few captures, since it leaves more pieces to arrange, but as we discussed earlier, captures allow pawn promotions, which allows you to diversify your set of pieces and have fewer restrictions on their placement. After breaking out the pawns by column, this actually isn't too bad. The multiplicity as white is going to start being different from the multiplicity as black, but since everything is still completely symmetric, every board state has an inverse board state where the white and black pieces are swapped and reflected vertically. And so the castle multiplicity is identical, and the white and black on passant multiplicities are swapped. Therefore, the sum of white multiplicity plus black multiplicity over all board states is equal to double the sum of either multiplicity over all board states. So from now on, I will always assume it is white's turn to move. Currently, for each two-color pawn column tuple, we're just computing the total number of pawn structures, and then at the end we multiply by the maximum en passant multiplicity of 6. Instead, let's leave that at 1, and then add more terms for the pawn structures that actually lead to a greater en passant multiplicity. This is simpler than the castling fiasco, since we just need to add one copy of each pawn structure where the a-pawn is potentially en passantable, plus one copy of each pawn structure where the b-pawn is potentially en passantable, and so on. Remember that it's white's move, so a particular column is potentially en passantable if black has a pawn on the 5th rank, the 6th and 7th ranks are empty, and white has a pawn on the 5th rank of a neighboring column. Specifically, we add a copy of each pawn structure with a white pawn on the left, plus a copy of each pawn structure with a white pawn on the right, minus a copy of each pawn structure with a white pawn on the left and on the right, to avoid double counting. Also, if en passant is possible, then the half move number is necessarily zero, since a pawn has just moved. So instead of multiplying by 101 at the very end, we can bring it into the sum here and only include it in the non en passant term. And there we have it. Since we've included every other aspect of multiplicity, we just multiply by 2 to get a game state bound of 4.214 times 10 to the 48th. This is basically the last bound divided by 6, which makes sense because the term where en passant is not possible completely dwarfs all the other ones. And for a comparison, it's less than the number of atoms in Pluto. We've gotten a lot closer to the true number of game states in the last 20 minutes, but there's still a ways to go. Here are a few examples of illegal game states that are still being counted. Here, there's no way for the white and black pawns to have gotten past each other without any captures. There's no way this white pawn could have gotten here, since it would have had to come from two columns away. The calculated en passant multiplicity only considers if there are pawns in the way, not other pieces. Although black only has two bishops, they are both on a light square, meaning a pawn must have been promoted. But black has eight pawns. Black's bishops and kingside rook can't have left the back rank, since all these pawns and the king have never moved. So the ones at the bottom must have come from three pawn promotions. 
but black also has six pawns. With all the pieces on the board and all pawns in their starting positions, the half move number must be at least the minimum number of half moves to get there from the starting position, which in this case is 20. White's king is in check, so this board state is only valid if it's white's turn to move, but right now we're counting it for both players. White's king is in double check, in a way that's impossible for black to do in a single move. This is as far as I'm going to go here, but more qualified people than I have pondered this question before and come to some even tighter bounds. For one, the same guy who estimated 10 to the power of 120 different games also estimated roughly 10 to the power of 43 board states, but both of these are really offhand general order of magnitude approximations and should not be taken too seriously. This isn't even an upper or lower bound. His reasoning includes a bunch of illegal positions and excludes a bunch of legal positions. Gross. But he was a bit busy inventing the field of information theory, so we'll cut him some slack. The current state of the art, as far as I know, is this, which gets an upper bound of 8.73 times 10 to the 45th game states and estimates about 4 to 5 times 10 to the 44th game states. There are also some links in the related work section to earlier results. I haven't looked into any of this work much, both because it seemed fun to try it out on my own and also because it was a bit over my head anyway. In any case, to answer the original question, if we want to construct a table of the best move per game state, we can easily come up with a canonical way to order the moves and then store the best move as a byte, since no game state has more than 256 valid moves, as far as we know. We can apparently do that in under 10 to the 46th bytes, and according to this, the current amount of digital data in the entire world is somewhere on the order of 100 zettabytes, or 10 to the 23rd bytes. So, if you look at it logarithmically, we're halfway there.